no, that's that's that no, that's uh, that's pretty that's pretty important. And then the other thing is, and I don't know really how this is going to shake out with AI, honestly, but I have a sense that people like yourself and systems engineers are going to be 10 x right? And I agree with that. The people can think from a system perspective, and then the individuals who can't bridge that gap and get to the system level and become you know, as engineers are going to really struggle because I, I've been using AI, Claude, uh, Cursor, all kinds of AI tools. And it's actually writing kernel code that just works. Wow. I've, I've done all the way from UI development, backend development, process productivity work. And the AI stuff just really works now. Uh, two or three years ago, it was still, you know, what it was. Oh. But it actually you can write serious code with it. And I think the, uh, you know, and then you'll see, I, I think the cybersecurity industry is really going to be impacted in a lot of different ways. There's a lot of stuff. And even as a CISO, there's a whole bunch of stuff with the proper agents and the proper security architecture internally. A lot of the stuff that I can do can be rapidly accelerated, right? So that I can focus on more important problems, whether it's compliance, it's automated, automated compliance, regulation reviews, all that stuff. That stuff's going to be addressed very quickly. And then, you know, threat surface analysis, attack surface analysis, incident response. Those are all areas where AI, I think, is really going to augment the security operations. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that is that is true. I feel like there's areas that it would be able to, you know, replace a headcount potentially, right? But like with everything, typically, you're going to find that the industry will cut, you know, so severely because they think that they're going to save all this money with having this LLM or this AI thing and getting rid of all these people. And then they're slowly going to be adding them back in. Like if you, if you look and if you actually follow it, you know, Microsoft laid off like what, 200,000 people in the past 18 months or something like that. I mean, like it, it was, it's a significant amount of people that they laid off. Google did, you know, the same thing, probably a different amount of people, obviously met up everyone and now they're hiring in other areas they're hiring in other key areas because they're finding oh okay we didn't need as many marketing people you know to do this work we can augment it with this other tool over here and then we can divert those funds somewhere else that's right and so we're we're moving into a interesting place but i kind of want to shift gears a bit and talk about beyond identity absolutely so talk to me about you know what Beyond Identity is, what the problem is in the marketplace right. that you're solving for and how you're doing it. Yeah. So, I mean, fundamentally, we're a secure access platform built from the ground up to address the new identity threat landscape. So we target identity threats directly and we design them out. We try to move as much from detection to prevention. And it kind of takes advantage. We do that by providing, I mean, if you look at Zero Trust, we provide Phishing resistant MFA will get into why I think most of the legacy phishing MFA we know is not good enough. But at its underpinnings, as phishing resistant MFA. It has strong device credentials and device posture, so it can do continuous authentication. We have a secure access layer and SSO. Um, and now we're starting to expand into kind of collaboration tooling like Reality Check, which is basically targets deep fakes. And so the problem fundamentally was when you, and it was a reimagining, it was from our founders and our, one of our, found, our founding CTO, Jason Casey, who had very early on recognized, I think, long before I certainly did, and a lot of other people in the industry, that uh, there, was, there was something radically changing. So where you had I, on the IT side, which was doing mostly productivity, and that's where all the identity solutions were. It was really about workflow management orchestration. And most of the security threats were at the network layer. So all your engineers, you know, that, that war between the, the red teams and the, and, the, and, the, and the blue teams was all at the network layer. As that started to, as we started to move out and started, everybody started using SaaS applications, bring your own device. You saw an explosion. You saw a, an explosion of all of that layer and, an, and it exposed an identity substrate was completely vulnerable. And then the IT administ the IT guys who were awesome people, but they were focused on a workflow optimization and identity management, all of a sudden had an entirely new security problem, which was identity. And all of the security engineers were trained for the last rate, which was network penetration, malware. You know, once you penetrate a device, you do lateral movement. Totally wasn't going to work anymore. So that's kind of where Beyond Identity came from. And we started with um, phishing resistant passwordless back in 2019, long before anybody else was had a enterprise level solution, had a lot of success there. And then we expanded into, like I said, the device posture. We have an offering called Device 360. 
that allows you to look at your device fleet, recognizing that the real problem, I and mean, when you get down to it, you know, if you follow the user's life cycle, right, and this is the next generation kind of secure access platform, they start on a device, they go to the access plane, and then they get to an application. Makes sense, right? A new platform has to follow that entire journey from the device to the access layer, and then finally to the application. Again, one of the things we're really excited about right now is our reality check solution that targets AI deepfakes. And that is only made possible because we can tie the device to the session to the user. And we can tell you who's actually on that call. So on our platform, can't you can't, it, it eliminates that deepfake threat. But anyway, so that's kind of where Beyond Identity came from. And we're having a lot of success at large enterprises, Fortune 50, all the way down to SMBs. Hmm. Yeah, that, that is pretty fascinating. You know, it's it was I think it was right around 2019, probably when I started to actually follow, you know, beyond identity a little bit, right? Because you were starting to do things differently. And the problem with identity security overall, just IAM, is it's a, it's typically an arduous experience for any sort of end user, really. I mean, yeah. you got to think about it, right? So you're you're not going to remember. 10 or 12 different passwords. I mean, it's just, it's just not going to happen, you know, and if it, if it happens, cool, but guess what? You're going to have to change them all eventually and you're going to be relearning them, right? So now you move it into a, a password vault, which is great. I mean, I use a password manager myself. I use one password. It's great. Does its job, does exactly what I need, you know? And, and so now I have this solution over here that, you know, has complex passwords in it. For all these different websites, but still for someone that's not technically savvy, right? My wife is a teacher mm -hmm. and I try to get her to start using, you know, one password and it's just oh, not going to happen. <laughs> you know, it's never going to happen, yeah. right? You, you bring up a good point and you mentioned the usability. So fundamentally, the enterprise and the consumer, at least on the surface, have very different requirements. But when it comes to password, learning, so let's even move away from password, just say it's secure authentication and secure access. They kind of look very similar because with an enterprise, you have to meet the user where they are and they have these massive heterogeneous environments. Some are deeply technical in you where you can put a PA in or a, a platform authenticator and you can device posture. Others, you have to use a, you know, a FIDO key or we have a, a solution which is called a, a hosted web authenticator, which allows us to engage the user just in the browser by right, security there. So... Even with the consumer, a password vault, that's a starting point, but it's not okay anymore, right? And we see that a lot of times at the enterprise level as well, where they have these, they, they weren't clear about how they were going to deploy the next generation MFA or a phishing resistant MFA. So they deployed an MFA, which is really just another factor on top of passwords. And so now they have these large heterogeneous environments where in some places they have phishing resistant password solutions. In other places, they have MFA solutions that are not phishing resistant, which they can be easily buy. And the other thing they run into is the user experience is horrible. Like if even in an enterprise, when you try to push an edict out, if the users don't, you're outnumbered. You worked on the IT side, you're outnumbered by your users. And if your users refuse to use something, it's really, really hard to get it deployed. And that's another thing that beyond identity, again, we're not. I know we're not supposed to be pitching our product here, but it's what I, just from my personal experience, if you don't focus on the usability, whether you're on the consumer side or the enterprise side, it's just not going to work. Yeah, I've uh, I've deployed privileged, privileged access management solutions before mm -hmm. to pretty large companies. And, you know, I, I've beaten every record that that vendor had of previous deployments of size and speed and capability and everything else like that, right? And so a huge part of that deployment, you know, I'm, I'm playing it to probably 12,000, 12,000 individual people, about a hundred thousand individual accounts, including onboarding, you know, servers and, right. you know, all these other workloads and whatnot. And maybe the biggest part of that was actually vocalizing it and kind of, you know, going around and making sure that all, all the people in the, in the company we're on board with this, right? And the biggest thing was explaining it to them in a way that, you know, related to like, not only just their job, but what's at risk, you know? And it was very convenient for me because one of our competitors had a breach very recently in that time frame. So I, I could literally say like, hey, they had a breach this exact way that we're trying to protect against. 
right? Like I know this makes your day a little bit longer. It's a little bit more difficult for you to log into this server that has all these social security numbers on it, right? I know that, you know. You know, let me interrupt there for a second. You know what's really interesting? And this is one of the things that, that we as an industry have to change. Why would a, a solution with no password be less usable than a solution with a password? It is kind of interesting. And oftentimes that's the case, right? Because again, the security wasn't the, like I said, you have to push security into the product and that's happening, but you also have to push usability. And that's exactly the feedback that I've seen in the market is your solution has to be low friction because we're trying to get users to authenticate and access safely. That it must include, it's got to be easy to use because if it doesn't, they're not going to use it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've seen it where users immediately start trying to just go around the product no matter what. You know, they, they just, they try to have like perpetual, you know, SSH sessions going and RDP sessions going and it's they're, they're, you know, logging into, you know, what I, I was at a company and we had this fantastic solution, right? Where if you didn't log into a server for a certain amount of time, you would lose access and you'd have to re-request it, right? Yeah. And the request just goes to your manager, they approve it, you get the access. Yeah, it's a, typical it's idea, like a, yeah. It's like an early form of just-in-time access. Yeah, Pam, IG. Yeah. yeah. So I, I was talking to like one of our top engineers slash developers, right? And he went and, you know, just all willy-nilly logged into a bunch of different servers, you know, right off the bat and he wasn't doing anything in them. And I'm on security, but he likes me, you know, I, I have a way yeah. about getting people to talk to me probably more than they should. And so I was asking, I was like, why do you log in, you know, once a week or whatever it is to to get in to these servers if you're not doing anything. And I'm like, what's the purpose? You know, you could really be opening up the environment to a foothold right. if, if your right. device ever got compromised, you know? Right, that's right. And he's like, well, I have to log in, you know, maybe once a month, once a quarter to actually do work. But at that interval, I, I have to go and like request permission you know, every time I log in and my kidding? manager isn't always available and, you know, like he had a whole list of excuses and I'm like, man, we have this multi-million dollar solution that we just deployed and bought. And, you know, we were talking about it with everyone, vocalizing how great it is and everything. And this guy is just having no part of it. He's getting right around it. And there's yeah. literally nothing you could do about it because he literally said, yeah, if it changes, I'm just going to start writing a script that has, that has a perpetual you know, inactivity monitor on it that'll just forever keep me active. So you you hit a, a key point for me. You're making a key point where it's a real pet peeve for me. And again, some of the legacy solutions that have tried to adapt from the identity side and the IT side have created all these add-ons and bolt-ons. And it starts to look like, an, it looks like security through configuration, right? Which is a really, really bad model, right? You want security by default. And one of the pet peeves I have is, and, and again, it's all about PAM, Privilege Access Management. Um, there's a lot of great stuff going on there and, and extending it. But fundamentally, the question you have to ask is, why, does, why do privileged accounts have a different access management solution than everyone else? So I think there's, again, it's rethinking the security solution. At the end of the day, when we talked about the access layer, you start from the device, cryptographically bind that, all that great stuff, device credentials, continuous auth. But even in the access layer, if that's built properly for the for the future, you have all of that privileged access management built into that access layer that's available for all accounts all the time. And you shouldn't be running into these kinds of problems. And that individual, that just wouldn't even be a problem because that's that's an artifact of having a really complex system that is it's no one's fault. It's just how we all got there organically. That is security through configuration. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's which is really a bad good model, by the way. Yeah, you really have to take kind of the guesswork out of it. 